Hello, my name is Ben Myron from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, and uh, I will talk today about the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics of therapeutic proteins now with part two. The goals of this section are to understand the distribution behavior of therapeutic proteins in the human body after administration into the vascular system, to appreciate the main processes involved in the tissue penetration of therapeutic proteins, to recognize the need for parenteral administration of therapeutic proteins, and to acknowledge the processes determining absorption and bioavailability after subcutaneous administration of therapeutic proteins. In contrast to small molecule drugs, therapeutic proteins are largely distributed in the body by convective extravasation rather than diffusion. Convective extravasation entails the following the fluid flux from the vascular space into the interstitial space, and then it's drainage through the lymphatic system. So there's a constant flow of fluid from the vascular to the interstitial space and then into the lymphatic uh, system, where it's then drained and ultimately reaches the venous bloodstream. Large therapeutic proteins follow this fluid flux. They do this by either paracellular or transcellular extravasation processes through the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels. That's indicated here where you have the transcellular process as well as the paracellular process, usually through pores between the cells. The more important process is the paracellular transfer. Dependent on the tissue and the endothelial cells lining this tissue, there are more or less pores available and the size of these pores also changes. In many tissues, however, the transfer is restricted relative to the transfer from the interstitial space into the lymphatic system as the lymphatic system or the, the cells lining the lymphatic vessels have many more pores and larger pores. So the influx into the interstitial space is much more restrictive as indicated by the smaller arrows here compared to the outflux. What that means, or in other words, the uh, lymphatic clearance is much larger than the extravasation clearance. What that means is that the concentrations in the interstitial space always remain substantially lower than the concentrations in the vascular space, as the influx is more restrictive than the outflux. By that, therapeutic proteins are largely confined to the vascular space and concentrations outside of that vascular space are substantially lower throughout the bodies. There are, of course, exceptions to that in organs where, for example, um, the endothelial lining is, is nearly completely missing or where there are a lot of uh, pores available, for example, in the liver sinusoids, where the exchange is uh, much less restrictive. And by that, of course, uh, the concentration in the vascular space and into the, in the interstitial space became, become more equal. So convective extravasation is driven by the difference in convective uptake into tissues and convective elimination via lymphatic drainage. Um, unbound IgG concentration as an example for this uh, remaining concentration gradient are approximately tenfold lower in many tissues compared to plasma. The extravasation rate also depends, as I mentioned, um, to uh, on regional differences in the capillary structure. For example, uh, in those tissues with leaky capillaries, you have less of a concentration difference between the interstitial space and the plasma. And then, of course, you have disease states where the uh, permeability uh, of the endothelium may be changed, like inflammation and angiogenesis. Uh, where the local endothelium becomes hyperpermeable to macromolecules, and by that also extravasation is more effective. 
as I mentioned, there's also transcytotic extravasation through transport uh, through the endothelial cells. This is usually facilitated uh, via membrane vesicles that are uh, transported from one side of the cell to the other and is usually receptor mediated. But overall, in most cases, it constitutes a much lesser degree to the overall distribution process rather than the convective extravasation through the pores, as I mentioned previously. Distribution processes are largely determined by molecular weight, size, shape, and charge and polarity of the macromolecules. So for example, the, for those with high molecular weight, they're usually confined to the vascular space and to the lesser degree, as I mentioned, to the interstitial space. So what is then the uh, typical uh, pharmacokinetic behavior after intravenous administration, you usually get a bi-exponential concentration time profile where the central volume of distribution is equal to or only slightly larger than the plasma volume, so two to eight liters, and the overall volume of distribution remains limited uh, for many therapeutic proteins uh, in the range between five to 20 liters. Examples are uh, provided here, erythropoietin alpha, diripoietin, tinectoplase, and thrombopoietin as some examples that have a vol volume of distribution at steady state between 0 0.05 and 0 0.06 liters per kilogram. Now, if uh, Therapeutic proteins need to be administered, and they would be administered by the oral route, then they have uh, no appreciable oral bioavailability. And that uh, means that they need to be administered by uh, intravenous administration, either at, as infusion or injection. The main reason for that is twofold. One is that uh, the gastrointestinal tract has high protease activity, so it's the most efficient metabolism site for uh, proteins in the body, for obviously uh, proteins that are taken off for, for nutritional purposes. And uh, in addition to that, however, there's also a low permeability of large therapeutic proteins through the gastrointestinal mucosa that has been uh, shown uh, in um, humans that have been given um, inhibitors of gastrointestinal protease activity, even with those inhibitors, you do not have any appreciable bioavailability. So there's a low permeability through the GI mucosa. That's ultimately the main obstacle for uh, or bioavailability of therapeutic proteins, and that's really related to the large molecular size, uh, uh, molecular weight and size of therapeutic proteins. So the alternatives that are then used are, as I mentioned, either IV administration or subcutaneous administration. Subcutaneous administration, especially popular for self-administration, shown on the right side are two examples for that. Uh, on the top and a dalimumab uh, single injection pan on the bottom, a multiple injection pan for uh, a flexpro pan for human growth hormone. Alternative administration routes that are used for some therapeutic proteins and have been explored is intranasal administration as well as uh, pulmonary inhalation. But again, these routes are more uh, niche administration pathways, the vast majority of therapeutic proteins is either given by intravenous administration as injection or infusion or uh, by subcutaneous administration. After subcutaneous administration into the subcutaneous interstitial space, as indicated here, uh, the therapeutic protein has the theoretically the ability to either be taken up into the vascular space, going on the left side, or in drained into the lymphatic system, and then undergoing lymphatic drainage and ultimately entering uh, the venous bloodstream. Since therapeutic proteins follow the fluid flux, the convective uh, extravasation that has previous that I have previously shown you, they also follow the same fluid flux when they are administered 
uh, by subcutaneous injection into the interstitial space. So there's a preferential uptake of large therapeutic proteins into the lymphatic system and only a very minor uptake into the vascular space. That has substantial consequences with regard to the rate and the extent of absorption after subcutaneous injection. Shown on the left side here is a relationship between the uh, percent of the dose that's recovered in the lymphatic system versus the molecular weight. And what's shown on the left are two small molecule drugs, 5-fluoro, 2-oxyuridine and inulin, and then two small um, proteins. And you can see that with increasing molecular weight, the lymph recovery in percentage of the administered dose is largely increasing, already uh, reaching approximately 60% for interferon alpha 2a. If you now imagine what happens if you give an even larger therapeutic protein, like an uh, albumin fusion protein with 69 kilodalton or higher, or a monoclonal antibody with approximately 150 kilodalton, then ultimately uh, nearly all of the administered dose will end up in the lymphatic system and will not be uh, absorbed into blood capillaries. So the larger the molecular weight, the higher the percentage that's absorbed into the lymphatic system. And as I mentioned, for large therapeutic proteins like monoclonal antibodies, approximately 100% of the absorbed uh, of the of the administered dose is absorbed into the lymphatic system. So what are the consequences of that? The first one is that um, you have slow absorption due to the much slower flow rates in the lymphatic system compared to the bloodstream. The second one is that you have substantial pre-systemic metabolism due to this long residence time in the lymphatic system. Since the transport is that slow, uh, protein molecules can interact with endothelial cells as well as with phagocytic cells, especially concentrated in lymph nodes where uh, uh, lymphatic vessels drain to, and by that they can undergo metabolism. And by that, they never reach the systemic circulation uh, when they are pre-systemically degraded. So there's substantial pre-systemic metabolism through this passage um, through the lymphatic system. And this reduces the overall bioavailability after subcutaneous administration for many therapeutic proteins. Uh, most monoclonal antibodies uh, have a uh, subcutaneous bioavailability in the range of 40 to 65 percent. There are, of course, always exceptions to that. There are some that have higher uh, bioavailability. But for many, you have a substantial fraction of the administered dose that undergoes pre-systemic metabolism before ever reaching the systemic circulation. So in summary, Therapeutic proteins leave the vascular space primarily via convective extravasation rather than diffusion. Thus, the concentrations in the interstitial space are usually substantially lower than in the vascular space. Therapeutic proteins are not bioavailable after oral administration and usually have to be administered parenterally. And absorption of therapeutic proteins after subcutaneous administration is largely facilitated by the lymphatic system, resulting in slow and protracted absorption and reduced systemic bioavailability. This concludes section two. Again, two questions as for self-assessment um, of the presented material.